fatigue and durability analysis with ENCODE Glyphworks. My name is Joe Spadola, and I am an applications engineer for HBM ENCODE, uh, and I am based out on the West Coast. The purpose of today's webinar uh, is to learn about some of the durability and fatigue character uh, capabilities within ENCODE Glyphworks. Uh, I have to qualify it using the word some uh, because Glyphworks has quite a large set of tools available to do fatigue and durability calculations and uh, going through each and every one of them in, in any sort of detail would, uh, would take quite a bit longer than the amount of time uh, that we have today. Uh, so what I'll do is talk about, or at least point out, uh, most of the tools we have available, and then spend a little more time actually showing you a demo of some of the most commonly used ones. This is our agenda for the next uh, hour or so. Uh, I will start by giving a quick background on ENCODE, the company or the brand, uh, and Glyphworks, the software. I'll then spend a few minutes talking about the importance of durability. Uh, since you're attending this webinar, I assume that uh, durability and fatigue already mean something to you. Uh, so this won't be a rigorous definition or uh, any sort of in-depth theoretical explanation of fatigue or durability, but uh, rather I just hope it to provide a little uh, motivation for, uh, for our moving forward. Uh, and then I will jump into a software demonstration uh, and introduce the user interface and show you some of the basic uh, capabilities of Glyphworks and then proceed into a, a, an actual demo of a real-life fatigue calculation uh, as well as some other interesting fatigue-related tools that uh, we have available in the software. Uh, and at the end, uh, we'll finish up with a uh, short question and answer session. Uh, okay, so <clears throat> I want to give you a quick uh, formal background on the software itself. Glyphworks is one of three software products developed by ENCODE, and it serves as a data processing system designed for analyzing measured test data. Uh, ENCODE has two other products as well. Uh, one is called Design Life, which serves as a fatigue analysis tool in the CAE domain. Uh, and it effectively turns uh, whole model stress plots into life plots. Uh, so the main input to Glyphworks would be measured test data, and the main input to Design Life uh, would be a solved FEA stress model. Uh, we have a third product called Automation, and Automation serves as a database for storing and managing uh, vast amounts of test data. You can think of it uh, as a MySQL or Oracle type database, but the unique feature about automation is that Glyphworks lives underneath it and can automatically process data as it's uploaded to the automation server. Uh, since our focus today will be uh, Glyphworks, I will dive a little bit deeper into some of its capabilities. Okay, as I've said already, uh, Glyphworks is a data processing system designed to analyze measured test data. It has a very powerful and easy to use graphical interface with uh, drag and drop capabilities that you'll see uh, in, uh, in just a few moments. We can deal with data in both the time and frequency domain. Um, the processes that you create are very easily scalable and uh, it can handle without problem uh, very large channel counts. We're talking uh, hundreds to thousands of channels and uh, huge numbers of tests as well. Uh, we also have something called one-click uh, reporting capabilities, which allows the user to uh, very efficiently and automatically generate a report of uh, customizable results. Uh, Glyphworks also has a wide range of built-in DSP tools, such as filtering and mathematics and stats, uh, running statistics, signal editing, anomaly detection. Um, we have a, a wide array of built-in fatigue analysis capabilities as well, uh, such as stress life and strain life, uh, and, uh, and also crack growth. 
we also have a variety of tools for noise and vibe analysis. And this, this here is only a, it's a relatively small subset of all the Glyphworks capabilities. I believe in version 11 now we have uh, somewhere over 100 built-in uh, and highly configurable uh, engineering functions ready for use. Uh, and again, the goal of this webinar is to discuss the fatigue analysis capabilities, so, uh, so that's what we'll be focusing on. <clears throat> okay, so what is the importance of durability? Uh, as I said earlier, we are all probably here for some reason. Uh, it's quite unlikely that you randomly stumbled upon this webinar and decided to spend an hour of your time listening to me talk about fatigue and durability software if you didn't already have at least a cursory understanding of what fatigue or durability is. I, I suppose I could be wrong, but I find that doubtful. Uh, anyway, most of you are likely uh, engineers or analysts or technicians uh, who are in one way or another responsible for some aspect of your company's fatigue analysis process. Uh, whether you have to figure out how long a part will last or figure out why a part is failing too soon or, uh, or what caused the part to fail in the first place or whether one design will last longer than another or even if uh, you know, one of your proving grounds is more damaging uh, than another. Uh, however you go about it, uh, if you're doing something along these lines, you're, you're all working in this realm of fatigue and durability. And one of the biggest challenges you likely face is figuring out what happens to your product or to your part in, in the real world. Okay, it's, uh, it's one thing to design uh, and test a part in the lab, but it's an entirely different thing when you give your product to a customer and let him or her loose with it in the real world. Okay, you can make assumptions about how they might use it and you can design to those assumptions, but you know, how do you take into account uh, a kid who, who dismantles his bicycle and decides to use his handlebars as a baseball bat, right? Yeah, clearly, establishing these, these service loads or the in-use loads, the real-world loads of your product is very important, or at least uh, being able to measure the expected service loads is very important. And from then, the, the next obvious question, um, which we'll quickly seek the answer to here, is what happens to your product um, due to these service loads, and more importantly, what happens over a really, really long period of time due to these service loads. And ultimately, that's, that's what fatigue is all about. How does your product withstand its service loads over time? Okay, how long does it take for your part to break? <clears throat> uh, I want to point out um, the important fact that durability is more than just fatigue itself. Uh, durability is, uh, is about answering more than just the simple question of how long will something last. Like I said earlier, we need to know what happens to your product in the real world. How is it being used? How often is it being used? At what speeds and torques is, uh, is it being used? Are, are these speeds and torques higher or lower than anticipated? Is your part uh, you know, over-designed or under-designed? Uh, is, it, is it being used in a hotter climate or a cooler climate than you designed it to? Is it being used longer at uh, some sort of unanticipated uh, operating condition? You know, uh, what are the everyday loads? And what are the abuse loads, right? How many, how many home runs does that kid hit with his handlebars? How many, how many curbs does your newly licensed teenager hit with your car? These are all important questions in assessing the durability of your product. And, and Glyphworks offers analysis techniques to help you answer all of those questions. Okay, and, uh, and one last thing I'll mention is that there are two specific types of durability uh, calculations. There is the absolute calculation, which answers the question, um, how long will something last? Okay, and, and by doing this sort of calculation, uh, you'll get an absolute answer, like uh, uh, 20,000 flight hours, or 500,000 miles, or, or a million cycles, uh, something like that. Uh, okay, so that's, that's absolute. And then, then there's uh, what we call the relative calculation, which 
answers the question, um, which design is better or which part is better, A or B? So the result from, from this sort of calculation would be something like, um, you know, part A will last 10% uh, longer uh, than part B. Or, you know, part Part B will uh, be predicted to fail in in some portion uh, of you know how long Part A will last. Okay. Uh, all right. So as you saw earlier in uh, the explanation of uh, ENCODE software products, uh, we have two routes for fatigue analysis. Uh, one is in the CAE domain through our software product uh, called Design Life that you can see on the right there. So again, the input to Design Life would be a solved FEA stress model, okay, where we then uh, inside ENCODE or inside Design Life, we uh, cycle those stresses, okay, and we can figure out across an entire model uh, where are the fatigue hotspots, not just where are the stress hotspots, that's what FEA does. We, we're finding out within Design Life where the fatigue hotspots are. Okay, uh, and then the second method uh, is through uh, measured test data. Okay, and this is through our product called GlyphWorks. Okay, and again, this is uh, this is what I'll be demoing here uh, for you in just a minute. <clears throat> Within GlyphWorks, uh, we have a wide variety of built-in fatigue analysis methods. We have the uh, standard stress life and strain life methods, which again will help answer the uh, the absolute question we talked about earlier, which is uh, how long will something last? Okay, how many cycles until my part breaks? Uh, we can also do relative calculations, uh, which will help us answer the question of uh, again which which design is better, um, or which part is better, or which uh, terrain is, uh, is more damaging. Uh, we can also do, uh, uh, aside from just stress life and strain life calculations, we can also do uh, multi-axial fatigue calculations, crack growth uh, calculations, uh, also uh, this would also be known as uh, linear elastic fracture mechanics or LEFM. Um, we can do uh, fatigue in the uh, vibration fatigue. Uh, we can do weld fatigue, such as uh, here I point out spot welds and seam welds. Okay, so lots and lots of, of different capabilities uh, are are available here. And again, we we don't have time, unfortunately, to uh, to dive into all of them. Uh, so right now, I'm only going to hit a few of the most uh, common ones. If you are interested in some of these other topics, uh, I suggest you uh, check out the full list of webinars that we have on our website. Uh, and uh, we likely have uh, done a webinar about uh, one of these uh, in the past. And keep an eye out for upcoming ones. We're always uh, releasing new webinars, so we might cover one of these topics in the, uh, in the near future. Okay, so uh, with that, I am going to uh, give a live demonstration. So I'm going to jump over into the software now. Okay, so when you first launch ENCODE, you'll be presented uh, with a splash screen uh, that looks something like this. Okay, <clears throat> over on the left, you will see uh, those three products that I just talked about, Glyphworks, Design Life, and Automation. Okay, all three of them live within the same user interface, uh, which makes it uh, very easy to uh, jump back and forth between, uh, between all of them. Uh, right now, we're going to be using Glyphworks, so all I have to do is click on the Glyphworks icon to, uh, to launch Glyphworks. As soon as you do, you will see, uh, you will see this here. Um, three important things I want to point out. <clears throat> First, on the very left, we have what's called the Available Data Window. Okay, this is a folder that you're pointing to on your hard drive, and Glyphworks looks in that folder and finds any sort of data that it recognizes. Um, in this case, I pointed to a folder that has some time series data. Okay, if I expand that folder, I can see that I have four different tests 
within that uh, within that folder. Okay, I apparently have some uh, some measured uh, data taken from uh, from an ATV, and it looks like I've got a couple of different varieties: 12, 13, 14, 15. So these would be uh, individual tests that uh, you know I I went to my my part. And I put, in this case, if I expand this a little bit further, I put a bunch of strain gauges on it and, uh, you know, drove it around a field or, or did some sort, of, uh, some sort of test with it. But I recorded through my data acquisition device, uh, it looks like five different channels, uh, and I did that uh, four different times. Okay. <clears throat> Glyphworks natively recognizes about 40 or so um, uh, time series file formats. So these would be uh, data files that come right off your data acquisition box. Uh, we natively read uh, quite a few of those. Okay, so you don't have to worry about figuring out the binary structure of these uh, uh, of these time series files, or you know, work with a million columns in Excel because you have it all in ASCII format. All right, Glyphworks just recognizes these automatically. Um, it also supports other files uh, such like Excel files and uh, histogram files, and we uh, not, are not going to be uh, diving into that today. But if it does recognize other files, anything that Glyphworks can do something with, it will organize it in this available data window over here on the left. On the far right, we'll see what we call the Glyph palette. If I expand this a little bit, <clears throat> the Glyph palette is where we keep uh, our engineering functions, okay? And we call these engineering functions glyphs. So each of these little boxes here uh, is a glyph of some sort. Um, <clears throat> we have them organized in, uh, in palettes here, and each palette has a name. Okay, so if I look in, say, the basic DSP palette, we will see our basic digital signal processing tools. Uh, earlier I mentioned some of the capabilities that we have for uh, for basic DSP or basic signal processing, and most of those live right here. So we've got you know differentiation, uh, we've got an arithmetic toolbox, we've got filtering, um, more filtering, integration, statistics, running statistics, um, time series calculator. Uh, we've got a strain rosette glyph as well. We'll be seeing that in a few minutes. Uh, so all of our basic DSP functions uh, sit over here. We've also got more advanced signal uh, editing capabilities. Here's where we keep our anomaly detections. Uh, we can automatically look for flat lines or drift or, uh, or limiting, uh, as well as a spike detection over here. Here's some of our frequency analysis tools. We've got uh, Again, more filtering. We've got auto cross correlation and convolution. We've got uh, joint time frequency analysis, uh, order tracking, uh, waterfall analysis. Under the fatigue palette, this is where we'll be spending our time today. We can do, uh, again, we've got stress life and strain life. We've got something called uh, damage editing as well, which we won't be talking about today. <clears throat> so this is uh, this is the glyph palette. This is where all the functions uh, uh, live. Okay. To just kind of start off with a very simple example uh, to kind of show how GlyphWorks functions, uh, I'm going to do a very simple calculation, not a fatigue calculation yet. I just want to show you kind of uh, how the whole GlyphWorks process comes together. So. I already showed you on the left here, we have all of the data that I have available to use right now. I've got my engineering functions on the right. And then in the middle here, in this, uh, this grid paper, this is what, what we call the workspace. This is where the process comes together. This is where you build your process. Okay, and in order to do that, we need some data. So in the available data, I can simply drag and drop that data out onto the workspace. Okay. It creates a an input for me, and if I click on display there, it will show me the channels I have in the test that I pulled out onto the workspace. I can maximize this to see it in greater detail. So you can see here I'm looking at uh, four of the channels. I can look at five of them by simply plotting five of them at a time. <clears throat> and this, you know, is a very very simple way to just visualize your data. 
Okay, I've got my five channels. You can see what range each of them runs to. Uh, you can see here how how long this time file is, this time series file. So this looks like it's just about just short of 10 minutes worth of data. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, you can uh, you know zoom in on the data. You can scroll around with the data. Um, you can, up here we have uh, a toolbar that allows you to view this data in a whole bunch of different ways. Okay, right now we're looking at um, five separate plots. You can plot them all on one plot if you wanted to overlay them. You can change the scaling on the axes if you wanted to look at log scaling. Okay, you can uh, zoom in, you can zoom out. Anything that you would expect to be able to do when looking at data, you can use this toolbar up here to uh, to do that. Okay, I'm going to get our plot back to normal for now. And okay, so with that, I'm going to pull uh, some different data onto the workspace. Okay, there's all my data. Now, I want to do just a very simple calculation to start off with. So I'm going to go over to my glyph palette. I'm going to go to the uh, basic DSP palette, and let's say uh, I've got this data here and I'm interested in uh, learning about the frequency content of the data. Okay, I want to look at this data right here. I want to look at it in the frequency domain. Okay, so I can use a tool that we have called the frequency spectrum to do that. Okay, and in the same way that I got data onto the workspace, I can bring my engineering tools onto the workspace by simply dragging and dropping them onto the workspace. Okay, so I've got my input. This is my input data. I've got a, an, an analysis tool, so my frequency spectrum glyph. And I need to view these results in some way. So if I go back over to the glyph palette, I'll see towards the bottom, I have a palette called display glyphs. If I click on the display glyphs, I could see I've got about a dozen or so different display glyphs. Okay, they all serve different purposes um, for looking at frequency spectrum results, which I'm about to do. Um, I'm gonna wanna look at what we call the XY display. Okay, so again, just drag and drop it onto the workspace. So now I've got my input data, I've got my engineering function, and I've got some way to view the results of that. At this point, all I have to do is tell Glyphworks, uh, you know, define how this data is flowing. So it, you'll notice on the sides of the glyphs, we've got these, uh, what we call pads. Okay, these are input pads. If it's on the left, it's an input pad. If it's on the right, it's an output pad. So in order to do this calculation, the frequency spectrum glyph is saying that it needs some sort of time series input. So I can take the the uh, the data that I've brought onto the workspace. If I click on the pad, okay, you can see that it creates a pipe. And I can then take that pipe and send it to whatever glyph I want. In this case, I want to send my data to the frequency spectrum glyph. So I click the output pad of this glyph, the input pad of this glyph, and a pipe is created between the two. Okay, so that means that data, all of the data that's contained in here, is going to be sent to the frequency spectrum glyph. Similarly, to view the results of that, okay, the results are going to come out of the output pad here. <clears throat> so I take the output uh, glyph, uh, sorry, the output of this glyph, and send it to the input of my display glyph. So now I've got my input data. I'm sending that data to my engineering function. The results of that are being sent to my display. Okay, at this point, I have everything set up. Um, in order to create, or in order to run this process, uh, up at the very top, we have another toolbar. Okay, uh, in this case, we want to look for uh, something that looks like a, a play button. Um, this will run the flow. So if I click on this, it happened really quickly, but you can see each glyph spent just a fraction of a second doing some processing. The data started here, it was sent to here, the results were calculated and sent to here. So in the same way that I looked at the input data, I can look at the results here by maximizing this glyph. Okay, um, <clears throat> I, I'm looking at frequency uh, data here, so I want to uh, look at this 
on a uh, not on a linear linear plot, but I want to look at it on a uh, make the y-axis a log scale. Okay, so simply change the scaling there, and now I'm looking at the results of the uh, frequency calculation that I just did. Okay, and again, if I wanted to look at all five of them, I could simply select all five, and they are all overlaid uh, on one another. Okay, if I wanted to view them separately again, I can go up to this toolbar here and uh, specify, uh, you know, that I want to look at them all separately. Okay, so so that's the gist of GlyphWorks. That's how you build a process within GlyphWorks. Okay, very simple. Uh, like I said earlier, it's drag and drop. You've got uh, over 100 glyphs over here that are available for you to use, uh, and you can just drag and drop them onto the workspace. <clears throat> okay, you can uh, build up these processes, uh, and of course, if I build something like this, uh, you know, and I need to do this many, many times with a whole bunch of different data sets, I'm not going to want to have to rebuild this process every single time I want to I want to process my data. So, uh, unsurprisingly, you can save these flows, uh, or you can save these processes. Okay, uh, so. What I'm going to do now is open up a flow or a process that I have already saved that will do the uh, the fatigue calculation that we talked about earlier. Okay, so I'm going to go open a new process. I'm not going to save this because uh, that was very simple. So I'm going to open up something I created earlier called simple strain life calculation. Okay, so here's a process that I built. I've got my input glyph here. You can see I don't have any data in there right now. Okay, when you save a process, the data is not saved with the process. But in order to uh, process it, all you have to do is drop new data in this glyph, and then you're good to go. So I want to process that data that I was just looking at uh, through this through this flow here, through this process here. So I'm going to drag and drop my ATV12 data onto this glyph, and you can see now one test is show, uh, shows up in the uh, uh, in this glyph. So if I click display, okay, I can see that data that I was just looking at earlier. Okay, this time instead of sending it to a frequency spectrum calculation, <clears throat> I am sending it to a strain life calculation. Okay, so this is my strain life fatigue glyph that I took from my uh, fatigue palette over here. Okay, this is this this glyph right here. I just brought it onto the workspace. You can see uh, as glyphs get more complicated um, or more sophisticated, uh, we have more options for inputs and outputs. Okay, if you were curious about what sort of input might be required, you can just hover your mouse over it, and it will tell you what the expected input is. Uh, also, you can hover your mouse over the output, and you can see what the expected output would be. Okay, so uh, at this point, <clears throat> I've already set this up, so I can simply run this process, and doing so will generate a bunch of results. So I'm going to run, and uh, all of these display glyphs that I have populated over here. Okay, the first thing I'll look at uh, as you know results from a strain life calculation. This glyph automatically creates um, a Rainflow histogram. Okay, rainflow histogram is just looking at, um, you know, w with the the data that I input, what cycles are present, what cycles, and at what range. The two uh, the two important driving factors of of fatigue is the uh, is the range of the cycle. Okay, so that's on this axis here. The farther out this way you go, the the larger the range. Okay. Uh, and then the second important factor in fatigue analysis is the mean of the cycle. Okay, so each one of these little squares represents a uh, a combination of range and mean. Okay, this is a, a 3D histogram. Okay, and so what we're looking at here is uh, is what cycles, and the z-axis here is how many cycles occur in each one of these little bins. Okay, the farther out this way we go the more damaging it is. Uh, because like I said earlier, the important drivers of fatigue are, are range and mean. So the farther this way we go, these uh, these squares out here are going to provide the most damage to our part. 
The bottom plot here is for the exact same channel, but this is what we call a damage histogram. Okay, and the damage histogram is showing us of the cycles in our rain flow histogram, which ones cause damage, and in the z-axis here, how much damage is caused by that cycle. Okay, uh, so this helps you characterize uh, the data that you've sent into your uh, to your input glyph. Okay, and these are fully uh, 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 these plots here. You can you can move around. Okay, so if you want to look at them in different ways, uh, get different angles on them, you can. Um, I think perhaps the most uh, common way to look at these is just a, a simple top-down view. Okay, this might be familiar to some people. <clears throat> Uh, and these are interactive plots like you just saw. So I can actually hover my mouse over some of these bins here, and I don't know how well it comes through on the on the WebEx, but you can see a little yellow box pop up on the left, uh, on the top left. This is showing me uh, how, uh, you know, the, the information or, or the statistics of the data that's contained within this uh, this block that I'm highlighting. Okay. So that's one interesting thing to look at. <clears throat> um, another interesting thing to look at is uh, what we call the damage time series. Okay, on the top here, this is the original strain gauge channel. Okay, in the histogram plot that I just looked at, it showed me what range and mean each cycle uh, in the input file contained. Um, what that doesn't tell me is where in time those cycles are occurring. So that's all that this plot down here shows me. It shows me where cycles are opening and closing in time. Okay, and this could be useful for some, um, uh, some, I don't know, certain types of uh, of analysis or certain types of, of, of characterization. Say you also record GPS data. Okay, you can look at when cycles are opening and closing uh, spatially uh, as well as in time. Okay, so if I were to zoom in on this, uh, the large peaks right here, you can see my damage time series is telling me that I've got a large cycle opening right here, okay, and a large cycle closing right here. Okay, so damage time series um, might not mean too much to too many people, but the important thing to know is that it shows you where in time cycles are opening and closing. Okay, if that's uh, if that's useful to you, uh, perhaps the most important uh, part of a fatigue analysis, of course, if I go record my strain gauge data. Ultimately, what I want to know uh, most likely is how long will that part last? How long until uh, I predict a crack to initiate at the location of that strain gauge? Okay, that's what this plot or that's what this table down here is showing me. Uh, so for ATV12, I've got these five channels here. And you can see here are the five channels. The calculation has been done for them. So channel 90 through 94, here's each of the channel titles. And then here is the information that I have sought. How long can I repeat, or how many times can I repeat this input here until I predict a crack to initiate at the location of the gauge? So this will show you a life in, in repeats for each channel that you input into the glyph, into the strain life calculation. Uh, so channel one, you can see uh, upper corner strain, <clears throat> it's predicting about uh, 17,000 repeats. Okay, so that means that I can do this right here, I can do this 10 minutes of driving around uh, or whatever this 10 minutes represents, I can do that 17,000 times I can repeat this 17,000 times uh, until I predict a crack to initiate at, uh, at the location that the gauge sits, okay? And again, this is doing it channel by channel, so multi-channel in, multi-channel out. Here we've got not only the results for channel 90, but also 91, 92, 93, and 94, okay? And each of those are going to uh, have, this glyph has done a calculation for each of those channels. Okay, the same goes for the histograms here. If I wanted to look at uh, not just channel 90, but channel 91, 92, 93, et cetera. Okay, so all of that, uh, all of the channel information you send into the glyph uh, will be shown at the end. <clears throat> uh, okay, so 
you can see I've got four uh, different ATV tests over here. If I wanted to uh, do this for all of these tests, okay, uh, I can do basically what I just did. Drop in the file, run the flow, look at the results. Drop in another file, run the flow, look at the results. Um, one advantage to, uh, to Glyphworks is that not only can we support multiple channels, but we can also, also support multiple tests at a time. So instead of running this uh, four different times with different inputs, I can simply take the rest of these files and drop them into this glyph as well. So now you can see I've got four tests in there. So I've basically queued up all of these tests. Okay, and when I run the flow, or when I run this process, okay, it's going to process it once, it's going to give me some results down there. I'm going to process it again, and then it's going to give me the results from the second test, the third test, and the fourth test. So now I've got a, a um, this uh, collated table of results from each of those channels and each of the tests. Okay, I could have put the test name down here as well, so you remember which. Uh, result comes from which test, but that's just a matter of adding another column, and uh, and that's quite simple. Um, okay, so that's a way to uh, drop in a whole bunch of tests at one time and let the process uh, just do its thing and and run without having to uh, without having to babysit it. <clears throat> um, each each glyph. So if you know anything about fatigue. You might have seen me do this process and said, um, how are we doing this calculation if we don't know uh, anything about the material? Well, I set this process up previously, so I had already selected a material. Uh, and I do that by going into the properties of a glyph. Each glyph has its own set of properties. So if I right-click on a glyph and go to properties, okay, it exposes a... In this case, it's a pretty large list of properties. This is a strain life calculation, and there are quite a few different properties that you can set in here. Okay, some of the uh, important ones that uh, that anybody familiar with fatigue might be familiar with um, would be mean stress correction. Okay, what mean stress correction do you want to do? Um, in this case, we've got Smith, Watson, Topper, Morrow, and an interpolation method or no correction. Uh, by default, it was set to no correction. <clears throat> Um, we have also got tools that allow you to apply a KF, so a fatigue concentration factor. Um, it asks you other things uh, as well. Okay, so this is, and, and like I said, each glyph has its own set of properties, and all the properties are uh, can be accessed by right-clicking and and then by right-clicking on the glyph and then going to properties. Okay. Um, one thing that I'll show you real quick, um, under the mode here, we have an option called damage. We also have something called scale factor. Okay, What scale factor does, instead of a forward damage calculation like I just did, um, where I take the input data and see how long it will last until a crack predicts, until we predict a crack to initiate, we can turn it around and say, okay, um, if you remember channel 90 uh, survived, I believe it was uh, 17,000 repeats or so. Well, let's say that doesn't quite meet the criteria that we set out. We needed to have 20,000 repeats. Um, so what we can do is use what we call this scale factor calculation mode <clears throat> to set a target life, okay? And in this case, I let's say I'm gonna set 20,000 repeats. You set a target life and then do a back calculation. And what we're going to get is what we call a scale factor. And the scale factor is going to be the uh, number by which you need to multiply the input loads by to achieve this target life. Okay? So I'm just going to run it and see, uh, see what happens. So I'm going to hit OK. Uh, I'm going to leave everything the same. So I've got all four of my tests in there. Okay? That's not a problem. I'm just going to run it. And it takes a second longer because it's actually doing an iterative calculation. But the result, you can see, as they're starting to populate down here, <clears throat> now my life for every single part is right around 20,000. It's within 1% of, uh, of 20,000. Okay, and the scale factor here tells me 
what I need to multiply this input load by, or this input uh, strain history by, in order to achieve this 20,000 repeats. Okay, so it looks like my stresses were a little bit too high. Uh, my strains were a little bit too high in this first channel. So I need to reduce my strains by 4% in order to achieve a life of 20,000 repeats. Okay, so, and then, you know, we've got that same thing for uh, uh, for every channel. Uh, if we have a number greater than one, that means uh, we have already achieved 20,000 repeats, and in order to achieve 20,000 repeats, we can actually increase the stress by, uh, you know, 1.18, or increase the strain by 1.18 in order to achieve 20,000 repeats. So, in these cases, when it's over one, in terms of achieving the number of repeats, uh, it's it's actually over designed, uh, I guess you could say. Okay, so that's uh, that's scale factor. Um, lots of other properties within this glyph. Lots of other calculation methods available. Um, we don't have time to hit them all right now. <clears throat> but again, check out some of the other webinars that we have if you're interested in doing that. Uh, one last thing I'll show before we get into the Q and A. Um, I've created a another process over here uh, that uses what we uh, what we call our strain rosette uh, glyph, and the strain rosette glyph is uh, essentially um, it, it takes in if if you have a, <coughs> a rosette glyph somewhere or rosette gauge somewhere on your part, and you record the measurements from these three gauges, we can actually look at um, the uh, you know you can you can do you can resolve the stress into a bunch of different things. Say you've got your gauge there and you're interested in uh, what the principal stresses are, or perhaps what the what the von Mies uh, von Mies stress is, or even the uh, stress uh, or strain at a particular angle relative to the gauge. Okay, that's what this glyph will allow us to do. So since I don't have any actual uh, rosette data, I'm just going to take. Uh, three strain gauge channels from one of my tests. Uh, for the sake of this, we'll just assume that they are uh, the uh, leg one, two, and three of our of our um, of our strain rosette, and uh, and process it that way. <clears throat> uh, and again, if you go into the properties of a glyph, you can see all the options that we have in, in this rosette glyph here you can pick and choose what output channels you want to look at. So I've got my rosette data going in. Uh, I want to look at the max principle and the min principle. And then I also, let's say, uh, I want to uh, resolve the strain to a specific angle relative to my rosette. Uh, so down here, you can specify the angles at which you want to resolve it to. Okay, And you can enter uh, uh, several different ones. In this case, I just want to look at 20 degrees. So again, I'm selecting max principle, min principle, and then I want to look at the strain at uh, 20 degrees relative, uh, or 20 degrees offset from the uh, uh, from my um, uh, the, the orientation of my rosette. Okay, so if I hit OK, I can simply run it, and the result then, let's maximize this, <coughs> is going to show me. Okay, assuming that those three channels I put in were the three legs of a rosette. Here's my max principle, here's my min principle, and here is the strain at 20 degrees from the orientation of the rosette. Okay, so again, lots of different ways to look at stress and strain, lots of different ways to do fatigue calculations, lots of different ways to do uh, just basic digital signal processing. Okay, a lot of that we didn't have time to hit in this, um, but let me uh, show, since we don't have time to do all that, I'm going to go over to this uh, glyph palette here and show within the fatigue glyph, okay, here we've got our crack growth, uh, we've got uh, strain life and stress life, okay, and all of these function in, uh, in a relatively similar way. Okay, you pull them out onto the workspace, you send data to it, you configure the properties of that, and then you get results from that. Okay, of course, each of them are going to have different options and different properties, and you're going to have to send different inputs to it, but the, the general idea is the same. Okay, you bring input data onto the workspace, you bring uh, engineering functions onto the workspace, and then you can view those results. 
Okay, I should mention uh, you can output results as well if you want to write data to your hard drive or if you want to uh, say, you know, create several different plots, put them in a form, and then every time you run this process, a, a PDF is kicked out. Uh, which is the detailed report of uh, of your process, uh, you can do that as well. <clears throat> okay, um, if we look at uh, the design life fatigue palette, just so that you can see what we have here, we have a wide range of uh, tools for the, the CAE domain as well. And again, here we've got strain life, uh, we've got stress life, here we've got a lot of weld tools, vibration fatigue. Um, Okay, and again, this is the design life side. <clears throat> if you're interested in learning more about that, uh, I encourage you to check out our website uh, for uh, other webinars that we have done in the past and keep an eye on it for uh, webinars that we have coming out uh, in the near future. Okay, so that's all I've got for uh, design life. Uh, sorry, for, uh, for Glyphworks. I'm going to jump back over to the uh, presentation now and uh, finish it up real quick.